Have movies become too violent? This is probably a question you've heard many times before, in the media, among friends, or perhaps even at school. It's no secret that films today seem to contain excessive gore and disturbing themes compared to older movies. What would have seemed scandalous a few decades ago is now considered relatively tame by Hollywood's increasingly daring standards. But do violent movies actually cause people to become more violent in real life? This is a subject of considerable debate, and there are solid points made by those on either side. There's a saying in AA, you can't make an alcoholic who doesn't want to drink, drink. And probably, similarly, you can't make a person who doesn't want to be violent, be violent. But having a fully stocked bar of booze around, or having hundreds of violent movies to choose from, probably adds to the allure for those who are committed to their preferred form of debauchery. If you're searching for evidence that violent movies could perpetuate violent actions, then we have a story for you to assist your thesis. Do you remember the movie Reservoir Dogs? It was a movie by Quentin Tarantino, came out in 1992. It's about five strangers, all criminals, who are hired to commit a robbery. The robbery goes bad, cops show up, there's a shootout, the bad guys meet up at the rendezvous point, realize that they were set up, and spend the rest of the movie trying to figure out who among them is the traitor. It was a popular movie. It had an 8.3 rating on IMDb and 91% on Rotten Tomatoes. Again, it's a Quentin Tarantino movie, so you know it's weird and violent. Seven years after the movie's debut, a group of teens named Alan Bentley, Mark McKeefe, and Graham Neary apparently had become obsessed with the Reservoir Dogs. But unlike the Hollywood movie's ending, they would find themselves arrested. In 1999, the three friends ended the life of one of their other friends named Michael Moss, and the murder itself strongly resembled certain scenes from their favorite movie, such as the bloody and savage murder of a police officer. So is this really an example of how Hollywood can cause people, especially impressionable youth, to go out and commit gruesome murders? Or were these boys going to commit murder anyway, regardless of the grisly content that Hollywood is known for? Let's explore the details of the crime, setting the stage for Michael Moss's murder. This entire incident occurred in Liverpool, England. This city is known for its population of working class individuals and it is home to some of the nation's most impoverished and at-risk youth. Michael Moss knew his eventual killers and considered them friends. They had met years before after all being placed in a special group for disruptive children. If Michael's childhood would have stayed on its course, he likely would have never been placed in a home for troubled children, but his family was bestowed a fate that only bad luck can explain. Michael was a good kid. He had two loving parents and came from an intact and happy home. After he was born, his parents decided that his mother should get back to work because of the increasing financial needs of their growing family. Because of this, Michael was tended by his father on the evenings when his mother worked, and in time, their father and son relationship grew very close. And then, tragedy. To quote Michael's mother, my husband went to work one day and didn't come home. When Michael was just 11 years old, Michael's father, Brian Moss, suffered a brain hemorrhage while at work. The man was there, but his spirit was gone. He had changed. He went from a kind-hearted father and attentive husband to a mean-spirited man. He swore at his family, he spit on them, he was unpredictable, and that was painful for his entire family. It wasn't him at fault though, it was the brain injury. Because Michael was so young, he couldn't grasp the change in his father. I think even as an adult, it would be challenging to understand and accept that the man you knew and loved was gone. His body was there, but he was a stranger, and a mean one at that. This unfair disaster would be a hard pill for an adult to swallow, let alone an 11-year-old boy whose father is the unwitting star of the tragedy. Tragedies are always hard to swallow. There's no one to blame, no fault to dish out, no way to go back in time and fix it, and no logic to guide you. It is just pain and confusion that appears to never end. This life event must have been absolutely devastating for young Michael. Things for the Moss family did not get better. The same year that Brian had the brain injury, he was eventually hospitalized and passed. Michael was just 11 years old. Some monumental misfortunes don't end where you think they should. The universe isn't done doling out the misfortune quite yet. After the death of his father, Michael began to act out, especially in school, and that is how he ended up being placed in a special school for disruptive children. This is when he started to rub shoulders with the other troubled youth, including his three eventual killers. For four years, they knew each other without incident, but as time passed, the friendship of the three killers had grown deeper. 
personalities became more solidified, deranged minds matured, and love interests began forming. Around this time, Michael began dating Alan Bentley's ex-girlfriend. For a young man troubled no less, who has no father figure to coach him or emulate his healthy coping skills, this is a dangerous scenario for everyone involved. Bentley now had wounds to lick and probably intuitively had a desire to prove his masculinity at what he would have perceived as the worst kind of slight. When Alan Bentley learned about this budding romance, he was furious. He told his friends that he was going to kill Michael. He began to plan out the horrific act. Bentley got together with his two close friends, Mark McKeefe and Graham Neary, and together they figured out the perfect way to lure Michael to a nearby park. Bentley also reached out to his ex, informing her, Tell Mossy when I see him I'm going to kill him. I'm going to boot his head in everywhere. That was a Scouse accent. While none of the boys had criminal records, McKeefe and Bentley had been expelled from school in the past. Their offense was assaulting another school child, and this particular victim was severely beaten on the same field where Moss's body would eventually be found. This victim, identified as Graylish in court records, was beaten so badly that he was hospitalized. Neary had also been expelled, although his crime was simply dishonesty. Teachers and headmasters would later state that while they knew the boys were violent, they had never seen them commit any acts that were even remotely close to the sadistic murder of Michael Moss. One teacher stated, Yes, the boys were expelled for assault on another child, but children do get expelled for things like that, and no one thinks it will ever lead to something like this. We had no indication that anything like this could possibly happen. No indication, you say, huh, teacher? To me, this sounds rather ignorant. My question to this teacher would be, what would it take for you to logically conclude that murder was within the realm of possibility? What action would have to have been in the boy's past for you to think that there was a potential danger to someone's life? The boys had already hospitalized someone due to their violence. It seems like that would be the perfect indication that murder was most certainly a possibility. But we have the pleasure of hindsight, so with that I will digress. Fourth boy was also apparently involved in this incident, but his full name was never released to the public. This is because this individual apparently tried to stop the attack and later faced a less serious charge. Around this time, Michael was obsessed with motorcycles and the crew knew that. They used this information to lure Michael to their predestined location, the same location where they had beaten their last victim. Moss took the bait and headed out to meet Bentley and McKeefe. The murder. At about 1 a.m. on November 13th of 1999, Moss received a phone call from one of the three killers. They told him about a new motorbike they had just got and they wanted to show him, and with that, Michael was lured out of the children's home where he was staying. He set out into the night at about 1.20 a.m. for the nearby children's playground that was totally deserted in the middle of the night. After arriving, Moss was ambushed by McKeefe and Bentley. They beat Michael to the point where he could no longer stand before leaving him lying on the ground. In a later statement to police, Bentley admitted that he had head-butted Moss before punching and kicking him while he lay on the ground. McKeefe was the one who stripped off Michael's clothing, except for his socks, and threw him in a nearby puddle. McKeefe would later claim that Bentley committed all the violence during the initial attack, but he eventually admitted that this was a lie, and that he had kicked Michael Moss multiple times. Another boy identified in public court documents as Breslin was also allegedly present during the first attack. He reportedly tried to stop the violence and did not return to the scene of the crime to participate in the second act. McKeefe and Breslin both departed together and left Bentley alone with Moss, who was still being beaten at this point. McKeefe's girlfriend was then apparently called. She later testified that the boys told her they had severely beaten Moss. Eventually, Neary, Bentley, McKeefe, and Breslin all ended up at Bentley's home. Neary, Bentley, and McKeefe then decided to return to the park, but Breslin did not join them. This is when the attack became truly sadistic. Apparently, they pretended to take penalty shots on the goalposts in the field, using his head as a makeshift soccer ball. They also reportedly lined up his body underneath the playground, allowing them to dropkick Moss's head from a six-foot distance. Bentley then smashed his bottle of vodka and began using it to deface Moss's body. When Michael's body was discovered, it was clear that the boys had played a game of tic-tac-toe on his back, also known as knots and crosses in the UK. They also allegedly tried to use the broken bottle to remove Moss's ear while singing Stuck in the Middle with You by Steeler's Wheel. This song was used during the infamous torture scene in Reservoir Dogs. This is perhaps the main reason why the murderers were later referred to as Reservoir Dog Killers in the media. Obviously, Michael Moss did not survive this attack, and he was probably close to death even before the more sadistic torture began. 
the aftermath. According to court documents, Michael Moss's naked body was discovered at approximately 7.30 a.m. by a man walking his dog. He had suffered more than 100 injuries. Forensic pathologist named Dr. Williams examined Michael's body and later testified to the extent of his injuries. Before passing away, Moss had suffered fractures to both cheekbones, a complete separation of the nose from the facial skeleton, and fractures extending into both eye sockets. According to the doctor's testimony, these injuries could have blocked the airways and killed the boy. Ten broken ribs were also discovered, and his cervical vertebra was broken. The latter injury was likely caused by a tremendous blow to the back of the head. He had suffered bruising throughout his entire body, and approximately 50 cuts were discovered in various places. One especially deep cut was found between the ear and the scalp. However, none of the stab wounds were life-threatening despite causing serious blood loss. Police found it very difficult to identify the body they found in the playground that morning, as Moss's face was completely unrecognizable. One detective later stated, I was handed a photograph of who we believed it could be, and it was a full facial photograph, clear as day. It was a young boy called Michael Moss. I can vividly remember holding that picture right next to the face, and there was no way from that picture that you could identify that as Michael. The boys faced murder charges, and they tried to escape legal consequences by concocting a questionable story. They claimed that Michael Moss actually asked them to initiate the attack because he wanted to file an injury claim and receive a settlement. According to the murderers, Michael promised to split the compensation with them. As you might expect, the story didn't really hold up in court. The boys gave differing accounts of what really happened that night. McNeary attempted to paint himself in a positive light, saying that he didn't really want to hurt Michael, but he was forced to kick him several times in order to look good in front of his friends. Neary also testified that he was the one who told the other two boys to stop the violent acts and call for an ambulance. But it wasn't Neary who called for an ambulance, it was McKeefe. This call was made at about 3.30 a.m., about two hours after the attack had begun. Unfortunately, the call didn't really achieve much because Michael was clearly already deceased and McKeefe didn't even give paramedics enough information for them to find the body. In addition, it seems unlikely that the boys genuinely wanted Michael to survive the beating, as Neary later testified that they had continued to beat the victim for a full 10 minutes while he wasn't making any sounds or movement. In other words, he was dead for 10 full minutes and the boys continued to beat the lifeless body anyway. It is worth pointing out, however, that Neary was eventually overcome by guilt and he was the one who confessed to the murder after learning that Moss was in fact dead. He went to the police the next day and told them that McKeefe and Bentley had committed the crime. While some might see this as a redeeming quality for Neary, McKeefe's account is not so endearing. McKeefe testified that Neary was the one who actually initiated the violence when the three boys returned to find the critically injured Moss on the playground. McKeefe also stated that Neary was shouting something along the lines of, look, I'm Michael Owen, before running up and kicking Moss in the face. At the end of the day, it seems impossible to figure out who actually told the truth, as the three boys were obviously trying to discredit each other in order to make themselves look better in the eyes of the court. The fourth boy, Breslin, was charged with violent disorder and not murder, allowing him to escape serious consequences. This was mostly because he apparently tried to stop the murder from happening, despite participating somewhat in the first attack. Perhaps most crucially, he never returned to the scene of the attack to continue to stab and torture Moss. While Neary and McKeefe were trying to paint themselves in the best positive light, Bentley could not hope for any preferential treatment from the court. He clearly had a motive for this crime, and he was out to get revenge against Moss for sleeping with his ex-girlfriend. There was also evidence to suggest that he had planned the attack on the previous evening, and police even found cartoons in his home of a bloodied and tortured boy. A Liverpool judge eventually told Bentley, You lured Michael Moss out that night, stripped him naked, and in due course the three of you killed him. Having attacked and injured him so he was unable to move, you left him, and later the three of you went to the scene where the appalling evidence continued. Michael Moss sustained appalling multiple injuries, internally and externally, as a result of which he died. Despite the fact that the boys were brought to justice, Moss's mother feels that the court system did not go far enough. The boys received special trial arrangements due to their ages, allowing them to escape significant consequences. In fact, all three of the boys have now been released after serving their prison terms. One of the boys even posted a picture of himself on Facebook, although he quickly deleted the image. When all was said and done, Neary received nine years behind bars while McKeefe and Bentley each spent 10 years in prison. Michael's mother stated, 
They have destroyed our lives. I will never forgive them. They are evil and sadistic. They knew what they were doing. They went out to do it. It was all premeditated. Do gruesome movies cause real world violence? Was Hollywood to blame? Lead investigator Bob Marsden doesn't think so. He stated, There is a parallel with the film, but I think they would have killed Michael anyway. My personal feeling is they got the taste for it and just did not know how to stop. Liberal Democrat David Alton takes a different view, claiming that these boys should never have seen this film in the first place. He is also calling for video censorship and distribution laws to be re-examined in light of this incident. The link between gruesome movies and real-world violence is difficult to prove. At the end of the day, there are always going to be sadistic murderers on this planet. While movies might entice them to carry out their dark fantasies, it seems unreasonable to think that government censorship would actually prevent murders from happening. In the United States, the argument of free speech would certainly be central to this debate. A movie created for entertainment couldn't be hidden from the public, as the work doesn't provide a specific call to action. With all that being said, the murder of Michael Moss presents a very persuasive argument to those who take free speech for granted. But perhaps young, impressionable youth should not be bombarded with incredibly violent media on a daily basis. Prior to one reaching an age that grants their autonomy as an adult, maybe parents should keep a closer eye on the content their children consume. Perhaps if these boys from Liverpool had never seen Reservoir Dogs, Moss might still be alive. Ultimately, we'll never know, and the damage has already been done.